Hello and welcome back as we continue our deep dive exploration of how the profession is changing. I'm Gareth Grok and joining me today is IFOA President Tan Sui Che and Marissa Hall, co-head of the Thinking Ahead Institute at Willis Towers Watson, a global not-for-profit research and innovation hub that's dedicated to harnessing the power of collective thought leadership in the investment space. So thank you so much to both of you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to be exploring what I think is one of the most important ways that the profession is changing. This change could perhaps be described as the broadening of the fields in which actuaries are working. Uh, actuaries, are, uh, you know, as I, I don't need to tell you, are most well known for their work in insurance and pensions. But today we're going to be thinking about how that work is changing in the future, both inside these core fields and external to them. Marissa, if I could come to you with that question first, how, how do you see the profession changing inside these fields and external to them? Oh, Gareth, and thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. You know, as you said, my background in the Thinking Ahead Institute is very much working within the investment industry. Um, I'm an actuary, obviously, by qualification and working with a number of asset managers and asset owners around the world. And I think regardless of which um, practice or which type of actuary you are, there are some skills which are needed um, outside of the, the specific technical ones. And I think, you know, what we like to focus on is the building of T-shaped and T-shaped professionals. So those professionals that have, yes, a depth of knowledge, but are able to connect the dots across multiple fields and multiple disciplines, and also use um, emotional intelligence and, and creative intelligence. Now, you know, when we talk about creative intelligence, it's influencing skills and that ability to work in teams. So within the investment industry, we have seen a move from having a star fund manager to actually investment decisions being based within a team setting. And actually, we believe that that's a robust approach to um, decision making. And so actually having those relationship building skills are important and also being very agile and adaptive to change. So there was some research recently um, of investment professionals where 90 percent of investment professionals believe that roles, your role will change multiple times during your career. And actually, that's quite a stark statistic. You know with certainty now that your likely career in five years time or 10 years time is going to be very different. And so actually being agile, being able to adapt to that change is quite important. I think on the other side, we see, you know, evolving levels of how do we evolve trust? And so therefore, you know, more and more organizations and investment professionals are being called to have higher levels of understanding of sustainability, ESG, and particularly in the investment practice and show some measure of responsibility to society. We know that all of our industries are, are, have a connection to wider society. And we know that you know, the returns that we need only come from a system that works. And so being able to have a systems perspective on how you operate is important, regardless of which field you are being able to apply that systems thinking that makes you think in loops instead of lines and understanding the connection between things. And that's a skill set that I think professionals as a whole need to come to better terms with. So that combination of, you know, we talk about, as we said, the T-shape. So that combination of having that breadth of knowledge across multiple disciplines, being able to be savvy with technology, and combine artificial intelligence with human intelligence to deliver better outcomes. And that purpose-driven professional that shows societal responsibility and understands their duty and builds that in professional ethics, I think that's the future of the profession. Thank you, Marissa. And Suiche, this T-shaped professional that's also driven by social purpose, is this is this a model that you recognise yourself for how the profession is changing? I think there are many drivers, yeah, uh, change uh, of which purpose uh, is an important dimension, yeah. 
And I, I started from a slightly different place, uh, but I was struck by the resonance of, of our language because she, she used the phrase uh, join the dots uh, across different fields. And one of the basis of our strategy uh, was uh, was about how we can navigate across the paradigms. Yeah? And, and, and the issue, uh, and, and, and for me, I think my starting point uh, was about relevance uh, and impact in, in a very simple way uh, in our workplace, right? How are the jobs of our actuaries changing, right? Uh, and, I, and the onslaught, the, the real practical onslaught, which gave the inspiration of IFOA's VSMD strategy two to three years ago, uh, was primarily due to digital uh, revolution uh, as well as the fourth industrial revolution. Because all the work uh, which we have been doing, uh, what we have been teaching our students was based on, on a print-based society and the way we collect data. But the onslaught of the way big data came forward and the advances of data science uh, was of tremendous concern for the council in the last three or four years, right? Uh, how do we change the way we educate our actuaries at a very basic level uh, to, to do their work well because their work will be taken over by data scientists or uh, by machines. Their task will be taken by machines, not, not the job, but the task could be. So, so that is a very much skill-based because data science go to the heart uh, of our training because data science is an extension of mathematics and statistics when things become digital. And, 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 and I was, so our starting point is that our basic skill set has to be modernized to solve the business problems of our time. Yeah? Uh, because had Reddington been alive, had James Dobson been alive, they would do that because they were using the most modern mathematics of their time to solve uh, contingency tables or humanization. So we had to do that because we were we, we got to be careful uh, to make sure that our profession is relevant. So that was a starting point uh, about data science. But we, we then also realized that skill set is not the answer uh, because things are going to change because of what uh, Melissa said, because, uh, because the whole industry structure is going to change, right? Because the way insurance is sold, whether health insurance uh, data is collected because of variables like you see in Discovery, Cent uh, Discovery uh, Group in South Africa, Africa. And there are many examples like this, or how car insurance will be replaced by autonomous vehicles. All that is going to impact the configurations of industries, right? Uh, so, so are our actuaries, uh, uh, are we giving the training so that they can thrive uh, in the next 30 to 50 years because to have, they're going to live longer lives, yeah? 40 years ago, uh, when I qualified, uh, I, I was with my skill set, I, I, I was given a safe and secure box. So we realized that what we give our actuaries had to be slightly different. Uh, and we actually coined the word, uh, a springboard for the future, which actually speaks to Melissa, the ability to navigate uh, across different domains. And, and that was the starting point uh, of the strategy. And of course, uh, Melissa talks about uh, the bigger issues of our time, which we need uh, systemic thinking. So at a very basic level, uh, we have to cope uh, although in the last 12 months, there are, there are less conversation about data science and digital, but the real issue uh, is still there because digital, uh, the digital revolution is going to change the way we live uh, and therefore the way we work uh, and the way we price insurance, the way we collect data, the way we form reserves. Uh, so that's a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a basic level and that's a very big deal, yeah, very big deal. And of course, uh, all the big issues about climate change, uh, pandemics uh, and the efficacy of our financial systems are even bigger issues, right? Uh, which Melissa speaks to, which actually calls to uh, a very different dimension because these issues, these systemic issues create uncertainties uh, in, in the world. Uh, and, and actuaries uh, are risk professionals and we, we are meant to ponder over problems and solve problems connected with risk and uncertainty. Yeah. Uh, and, and we have been too much in the area of risk in the last 15 years because we are doing it within the system. Uncertainty is beyond the system. Uh, so I think it's a great uh, opening for the profession uh, in this context. Thank you, Suchai. 
And Marissa, do you do you recognise um, from your work at the Thinking Ahead Institute this um, inhabitants too much in the, 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 the sphere of risk and not enough in the sphere of uncertainty that Suiche mentions? And also, I'd like to know your views on the modernisation of the actuarial skill set. Yeah. So I think uncertainty, I mean, it's such an excellent point because, you know, we talk about these unknown unknowns. So things that you can't, you can't know and it's, you can't quantify and therefore you need to have an element of margin to account for the fact that you can't know everything. And I think, you know, the more, the more experienced you are as an actuary, as you get in the profession, the more you realize how much you don't know and the more how complex things are. And this is why we talk about, you know, thinking in loops instead of thinking in lines and understanding the connectedness of things. And we see that particularly in the field of, you know, when we talk about climate change. And the point is, is that, you know, many climate scientists have said for years that there are these, these points called tipping points in which there, you cannot say that there's going to be a linear um, relationship between temperature rise and the outcomes, because actually there's a tipping point at which things can change dramatically. And one of the features of being in a, in a complex adaptive system is that you have um, reinforcing um, loops and you have dampening loops, dampening systems. And actually what we need to make sure is that for all of the reinforcements that we have, we have enough dampening systems in there, enough checks and balances to make sure that um, you know, we don't end up in a, in a, in a catastrophic state. And that, those checks and balances, you know, I think are very relevant to the actual profession. And so, you know, it goes to the point that Suichi raised about um, training and building up that basic level of skills and understanding about uncertainty. I think when it comes to, you know, your second point about, um, I believe it was about the future of the profession. You know, I think what we're seeing is we're seeing um, culture become a key topic, you know, particularly in the investment industry in which I work at, and understanding what we mean by the culture of organizations. And, you know, a lot of our research in, in the Institute isn't, isn't around culture and sustainability. And actually, you know, typically when people think about culture, they think, well, this is just the way it is. This is the way that things are around here. But actually, with more conversations, actually, we need to understand how things are done this way and why things are done this way in culture and recognizing that culture is a movable, um, a movable target that you can change and adapt. And some of the elements that we look at when we think about the culture of organizations and the professionals within it are we think about innovation. We think about how does your organization learn from failure you know, that, that test and fail um, feedback loop. We talk about things like diversity and inclusion. So how do you build the collective intelligence of teams, you know, to produce better outcomes and decisions? And we talk about things like, you know, um, transparency and openness in an organization. So how does information flow and the purpose of your organization and being able to articulate it and the behaviors that are are acceptable in an organization. So when I think about the future of the profession, I also think about, well, how, what, what culture are organizations trying to target? And how do organizations measure that culture? And how do they manage that culture? And how do the professionals operate within it? So we need, we need more thinking along those lines and we need more thought leadership in that space because that's how, as a profession, we can make a difference to, you know, to individuals. What is our thought leadership position on many of these topics? Thank you. Uh, it's quite, a, quite an amazing array in which uh, the profession is, is changing, really. We have digital transformation, the culture of the organization, a focus on innovation, diversity, inclusion, systems thinking. It's, it's, a, it's an enormous dizzying level of, of change. Can I, ask, can I ask you, Marissa, what, what do you think is driving that? So that's a, what, what's, what's increasing the pace of the change in the industry at the moment? Yeah, no, we're definitely in, in the great acceleration, isn't it? The speeding up of the speeding up. And I think it's that, you know, 
it short, short answer is that recognition of the fact that we are so interconnected with the system around us and that actually, you know, we've seen it this year, we've had three defining moments this year, which seem to have changed everything. So we've had once again, the reminder of the importance of climate change at the beginning of the year with um, bushfires in Australia. You know, we've had um, the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, and recognizing that actually all of our health and economic systems are very much aligned. And then we've had issues around social justice. So we talk about, you know, the killing of George Floyd in the US and that, that once again, re-triggering, um, you know, a passion for, for individuals around the world to say, respect our identity, you know, understand that diversity is important. And so what's happening is, is that, you know, when every one of these incidents and events happen, it's just a reminder of how connected all our systems are. And the pace of change is relentless, as you say, you know, things are, it's speeding up. And Suiche, do you, do you concur that these macro factors just demonstrate the importance of modernizing the actuarial skill set to take account of these large driving forces that we see in the world? Uh, uh, the, the short answer is yes, yeah. Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, uh, but I, I think that we, we also got to frame it uh, uh, appropriately um, uh, because we have, we have a very diverse uh, profession. Uh, when people go to work tomorrow or in 12 months time, the pandemic is real uh, without doubt. But their work may not really change that much, right? <laughs> in twelve months time or twenty-four months time, but but I think in five years time, ten years time, uh, it, it will begin to diverge, right? It will begin to diverge. Uh, so so we, we do not know what the precise changes are. Uh, we know that we are at an inflection point of sorts because of the three big issues which came together in the last twelve months, and to that you can also add uh, to the rivalry uh, between US and China, which create another shock, right? Uh, and also um, uh, 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 global efforts, uh, global cooperation had become more national uh, throughout the world. Uh, people are withdrawing from global institutions. So all these uh, 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 all come at the same time in the last two or three years. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we do not know how the change is going to evolve, but I think, but as far as our work is concerned, uh, we could, change the way we respond to the change, right? Uh, respond and how do we prepare for it? Um, but there are different commentators uh, who comment on different things. And they will say that actually we have been through many other more important inflection points like industrial revolution or, or when men started to become uh, agrarian, start planting, you know, changes. Uh, but, but in the zeitgeist we live in, in our lifetime, the pandemic is a big deal, it's, a, it's the first time which I've seen a crisis so global and the uncertainty felt so global. Uh, so, so I think that we have to choose our response to it, right? Uh, because we don't know where you will end. So in terms of digital, as well as in terms of the big sustainability issues uh, of our time, yeah. Uh, so so uh, there we are. Um, uh, I, I need to get the essence of your, what, what was your question again? My question was really switching about the um, what was driving the, these these many different changes that we're seeing in the profession at the moment. Is it these macro factors? Or? I, I think I think one of the big, very easily identified factors is actually digital and the fourth industrial revolution, right? Because it, it, it defines how our work is done. And our work is largely about data and, it's, and data science becomes core. So that, that's the heart of what we do. So that is changing. And because of digital and, and, and fourth industrial revolution, uh, all the, the, the things we provide insurance to or pensions to or risk management to, because the way we work are going to be different, right? So, so that is the first thing, right? And that was really the rage uh, before climate change uh, and pandemic and Black Lives Matter came to the foreground, yeah? But in the last 12 months, all this came to the foreground, starting with the bushfires uh, and also things like all the riots popping up in Hong Kong and elsewhere. And suddenly the world feels a bit different, a bit vulnerable. Yeah? And, and, and what I would call, these are 
uncertainties, uncertainties. Yeah. So you have the digital one. The digital and fourth industrial one, I think, requires a, a slightly different response. It's about the innovation mindset. You've got to go to be more entrepreneurial. So, so that is one category. And there's, there's something we can get our heads around it. Uh, so the future of the professions by Richard Susskind, uh, and Mission Platform and Crowds by Eric Boyd Johnson speak to that space. Yeah? The digital is going to change the world because the world is based, up to now, is based on a print-based society. So that was still a very complex problem because it's going to take away all our valued life tables and compound interest tables. They're going to take that away. Uh, and, and besides, we are not going to be able to measure morbidity based on life tables but based on data provided by wearables and and social platforms and all that. So there's a big deal, yeah. But but the second group of change, which is has to do with what I call uncertainties or, or, or sustainability issues, which is about climate, because we have been exploiting Mother Earth uh, uh, for so long, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and also the bio biodiversity loss, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, that's one aspect of it. Uh, I think Black Lives Matter has a different history uh, on social justice uh, and pandemic. Pandemic is because of our global connectedness, right? Uh, I, I'm not sure what happened in Wuhan. Somebody could have eaten something and then the world, whole world is plunged uh, into uh, the biggest uh, uncertainty I've ever felt since I was born. Yeah, uh, because we, I, I'm not it's amazing if you ask me 12 months ago that this would happen to us you would, wouldn't be able to imagine it right and that's because the world is so connected right it's uh, so connect, interconnected and the way we travel we just spread right so these are very non-linear risks right non-linear risks and non-stationary risks right but we are not we're not that good in that because we don't measure that we, we are more we more measure more stationary risk, right? Because we have property distribution, and that was a major achievement of the actual profession. But now it's a time to go back to look at the uncertainty which is posed by all these nonlinear risks. And I think that uh, Marissa talks uh, about systemic thinking or systems thinking, uh, which is really about second order. We are not trying to solve the problem in the first order, right? We are trying to solve the problem in the first order. To give an example, this is a ship you are trying to turn the handle, polish, whatever, or put on. But actually, you, you shouldn't be traveling in the ship in the first place. You should be traveling, you should be doing some, something else, yeah, which is really changing the system. That requires a slightly different mindset. That requires a second. Uh, and I think that um, our strongest mindset on accuracy, cautiousness, and reticence, and uh, consistency makes us very good systematic thinkers. Yeah, But dealing with uncertainties, we've got to invoke systems thinking yeah, which is more systemic thinking and and i i i take a leaf out of uh, reddington's speech uh, as well as ronnie bowie who is the first president of ifoa uh, the scottish uh, first president of ifoa uh, who, who talks about bonus and courage right reddington talks about imagination because courage and imagination are required right, to think systemically but always paired with judgment, right? Uh, and, and many books have been written about uncertainties, and uncertainty cannot be solved mathematically. Uh, it had to be solved by metaphors, narratives, and judgment, right? And that is a very difficult hit concept to get round, yeah? But if you think carefully about it, uh, if you look at our history, um, at, at the great actress, um, John Morgan or James Dodson, Nakem or whoever, yeah, they, they were actually uh, dealing with uncertainty at that time. Yeah, they were trying to reduce uncertainty into something which is uh, measurable uh, because it's probabilistic, right? So they gave us this whole set of tools, right? Uh, and then we 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 now got data science, uh, which is actually uh, from big data you could churn out rules and heuristics, whatever. But now we have got another box of uncertainty, which is about uh, nonlinear systems, right? And how do we tackle that? Uh, so we need some thought leadership uh, in, in that space, la. and I and I think uh, and it's and it is that concerns all of us, and we have a special obligation. I think obligation. Uh, I think if we are actually want to say that you continue to do your systematic work, but we call ourselves risk professionals, right? And if you call ourselves risk professionals, uh, 
you are supposed to make ourselves resilient against uh, adverse consequences, right? So it's uh, so your risk system has to be good, but but to be a, a risk, a true risk virtuoso, professional virtuoso, you have got to make sure that whatever models you rest on, the underlying uh, system is sound. So a very good example is Northern Rock. Northern Rock has a triple A rating, a triple A rating two weeks before it collapsed in UK. Yeah, and that's based on the the checklist on risk register and all that. Now, so it's wrong, but 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 the assets, the liquidity of assets in a, in a, in that time because of uh, the, the way the demand for liquidity uh, at that time, they couldn't convert it to cash. You see, and, and it collapsed, right? Cooperative bank in the UK has, uh, has the same issue. Uh, was rated as the the most sustainable bank by Financial Times and Euro Money in two years in succession, and then they had an issue because it is not about risk reports; it's about the soundness of uh, the board and the management and the culture, which is not fully captured. So you really got to look much beyond. So I was in a presentation recently, and one of our actors talked about multi-traded narratives, right? And he talks about um, the trajectory of different outcomes, yeah, uh, and, and we got to bring the people into a room to ask very simple question uh, what's going on here uh, what's going on here uh, what could go wrong uh, it's not about trying to over analyze uh, although analysis is important because it gives you a false comfort uh, you give you a false comfort that you are sound or secure but there's something else happening right and i think that that belongs to uncertainty and this uh, uh, talk about judgment yeah. And Mervyn King, who is the Bank of England uh, governor, a chair of the governor of Bank of England, right? Uh, but he suddenly wrote a, a fairly uh, extensive book called uh, Radical Uncertainty, along with John Kay, uh, who incidentally has agreed to speak to the IFOA in March, yeah? John Kay, uh, along with uh, a number of other luminaries yeah? uh, uh, about uncertainty and the financial system. Uh, he, he, he laid it all out, right? Uh, and I think it's about uh, blank judgment and narratives, right? And that is not an easy concept uh, for us, but I think that recognition of that uh, is a good thing, yeah? Uh, and we have people who have written papers about it in the IFOA, and we just got to bring it to the foreground, right? Uh, to, and to bring thought leadership more into the foreground. Uh, and I wouldn't say that we have the answers. We are a small profession. You know? So whether we can solve any problem uh, in a dramatic way uh, is really open to doubt. But we can contribute uh, to the solution because we are risk professional. And I think changing our way we think about it could be liberating, yeah? liberating instead of being just a, a rule taker. I, I, I'm not sure it's fair, but I certainly say in my presidential address, I, I, I sense the profession has been, after the Morris review, uh, after the fall of equitable, has been more inward looking, more inward looking, and more concerned about getting things right. And I think it's probably right. But the world, I think, I think as risk professional, it's time to uh, maybe be a bit, a bit bolder and, and, and stick our head out and say that, okay, actually, that's our view on climate change. Uh, yeah. We don't have the answers, but we are ready to take part and, and be slightly be, be more courageous, yeah? slightly be more courageous in Arctic and speaking to the social issues of our time. Yeah? Because I, I think that, that that is important. Yeah. Thank you, Sui Chai. That, that's a fascinating sort of other side to um, the discussion. You spoke a lot about mindsets, courage, judgment, and, and approaching things in a, in a different way. Um, Marissa, where where do you see the profession going next? And what would you say to actuaries who wanted to start working in it today? Yeah, no. Um, gosh, good question. So just to address that point, is is this time different? You know, all of the things that we've seen, you know, just this year, is how is it different from crises before us? And I think there's a very good point um, Suiche made about, you know, for many people, the, the world, you know, in the profession, it feels as if it's just going on. And, you know, it's it's never different on our 
inherent behavioral biases and our natural reversion to old habits. You know, our, our, our modus operandi is go back to business as usual, use the same models, use the same form of thinking. And regardless of how the world changes around us, you know, we are naturally resistant to change because we're accustomed to things. And I think what is different is that the state of the world is, is even more complex and we are understanding the linkages between things more so. And it's enormous. Some of these game changers are absolutely enormous. And so I think the important message here is, is that how do we as a profession adapt our way of thinking, adapt our skill set for this world, which is just speeding up? You know, and we talk about, yes, being risk professionals and, you know, within the investment industry, we talk about the shift in paradigm from two-dimensional investing, which is just looking at risk and return, but introducing a third dimension called impact. And impact, our investment decisions have always had an impact on society. It's just that historically we've put a zero weighting on this. And actually, as more professionals embrace that our decisions have an impact on wider society and on the, on the planet, and actually those decisions operate in a feedback loop into how we are able to operate and the returns that we are able to generate, then we recognize that we need a more expansive way of thinking. So in terms of your question, you know, what advice I'd have to actually, where do we see the profession going next? I, I naturally see a world where we can no longer rely on those linear forms of thinking. If you want to be the professional of the future, you need to be more creative. You need to show more bravery and courage as Sui Jin made. You need to understand the responsibilities to multiple stakeholders. And obviously integrity and respect and ethics becomes paramount as things become more complicated. And so for young people hoping to join profession, I, you know, I remember many years ago, I wanted to be an actuary. I wanted that badge of the profession. And you do your exams, you pass through, and then you say, well, what's going to happen now? But actually it's the day-to-day -day practice. It's applying the judgment. It's recognizing that things are complicated and not straight. That's really an important mindset to get your heads around. But it's a wonderful profession to be in. So. Thank you, Marissa. Um, I'll, I'll end um, just by coming to Suiche, just to, to say, uh, Suiche, what, what's the IFOA doing to support this change in the profession? Could I just touch on uh, um on some of the points about joining the profession, uh, because I have been speaking to many students, yeah, uh, actual students and young actuaries in Malaysia, Singapore, China, uh, Africa, uh, UK, uh, Ireland, yeah. And, and the way I have uh, told them uh, is that it is an extremely good time uh, for them to join the actual profession if they have a natural inclination for mathematics and analysis. That is core, that is a non-negotiable. And that they want to make a, a difference uh, uh, in a very practical setting. Yeah? Uh, because you have been great in mathematics and be a theoretician, but this is a practical setting. And, and also if you want to make a difference in social impact issues of our time. And it's a good time to be an IFOA actuary, uh, because I do believe in that. Because, and that actually ties in with your next question. Uh, what we are doing to prepare actuaries for the future, right? Uh, firstly, you must give them something tangible uh, because uh, you can talk about abstract ideas uh, and all that. Uh, and I, I, I've been challenged many times. Those are all abstract ideas. What are you doing next year? Yeah. So you've got to give them the skills, uh, the data set skills. So we, are, we have a, a data science uh, a certification which we have and we are enhancing the data science credentialization because that's core. You must be able to adapt, right? And if you want a climate science certificate, which we are working very hard on, and we are also make, working in diverse fields. So a banking fellowship is coming up, and there are other, other things in the pipeline. So those are in the area of skill sets. But more importantly, uh, uh, is in the area of mindsets, uh, which I come back to later. 
But in the area of skill sets, we have a community which was example, uh, which is about uh, it's called Moonshot, and uh, and and we have decided strategically and philosophically about the way we are going to train actuaries uh, and also educate actuaries. It's not going to be based on exams and qualification, although they are still important, but it's about learning and continuous learning over the entire lifetime, which is going to get increasingly longer. And that is a a very big change if we do it um, sincerely and faithfully because uh, we have a culture of passing exams and doing a qualification conscious and but those are still important uh, standards we need to to, to achieve uh, but uh, but but learning should not stop there uh, it has to be continuous learning and there's a culture of learning which which we are eager to inculcate uh, the other two which we were uh, we were talking about would be um, that we will be flexible in the way uh, we credentialize actuaries uh, in terms of uh, creating optionality and modularization. And we will work with external suppliers yeah, or external partners in terms of providing education. Because the whole thesis uh, about uh, the BSMD strategy is that actually uh, more solutions you need are multidisciplinary. So by definition, you can't have the answers. And the answers cannot be based on past analysis. It must be future orientated. So you've got to go outside and, and you've got to be quick to market meeting up the needs. So that is quite a big change. For that change to take root, uh, the cultural transformation of IOA needs to take place. Yeah? Uh, so, so that is answering uh, the question uh, on what we are doing to support. Uh, that is more organizational. Uh, but there is something else yeah, uh, which is about uh, culture and mindset, and I said in my presidential address and in part of my presidential manifesto that we've got to transform uh, the profession in terms of mindsets. Yeah. So in other words, we got to be uh, willing uh, to be more adaptable, to be more curious, to have the growth mindsets which calls for experimentation, perseverance, uh, and learning from failures. Yeah. Uh, so th these are very uh, not is is uh, is very uh, standard uh, not standard uh, they, they are not big discoveries uh, they, they are accepted uh, I, uh, they are accepted qualities you need to thrive uh, in a digital world in a digital world of innovation right uh, but I, I think more latterly is about sustainability issues and I think I spoke about courage uh, imagination uh, so that is something we want to model. We want to speak to, uh, and increasingly we have to bring the examples, uh, the role models, the thought leadership pieces uh, into the foreground. Uh, so that's how the institute uh, is preparing. And I and I and I also would say that it's not something you can press a button and it happens. Uh, we, we, it has to have be repeated uh, over time uh, by our leaders, by our role models, uh, by our communication, and, and and then the world might feel a bit different. Uh, uh, the way we think about ourselves, if it's a bit different, the world will start changing. I, I think I read famous, uh, the famous quotation from Mahatma Gandhi, right? Say the world begins to change when you change yourself. It's really not about other people changing, you know, you're not doing this, but actually the way we, we do things ourselves. And I, and I think that it has to start uh, at the council, at, at the IFOA executive team, uh, it, and it's reflected and it will be percolated. And I think I like the word uh, Marissa used, tipping points. The tipping points and the cascading effects will take place. And we are not in control of it really because we are also part of a system. <laughs> so we, we've got to start the process, yeah, let's start the process. Wonderful, thank you so much. It only remains for me to thank you for the time that you've both put in today. Um, it's been a fascinating discussion and I hope our, our listeners will join us uh, for further podcasts as we explore the change in the actuarial industry. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you, Suiche.